All right, let's begin. Good morning, everyone. Um, so let's see. First, a few announcement things. So today we're going to, again, sort of cover some topics from 12.1, 2, and 3. As I said before, I kind of think it makes sense to sort of do them all at once rather than one first and then the second and the third. Um, I'll be available for homework help today, 5 to 6 in the dining hall. Um, and tomorrow, 2 to 3. Are you sure you wanted to do a time? I meant to say, like, so you had 6.15 to 7.15 since you're, like, leaving and have things to do? If you don't want to do it, I think we'll all survive. Yeah. Are you you're okay? I'll, I'll look at my schedule. Okay. Um, but I didn't know how many other Yep. I mean, I think, I think this should be enough. Um, and then Ian, um, 4.30 5.30 on Friday in the um, botany lab, which is like over there. Um, Email me if you don't know how to Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, our campus is, 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 is small. And like, we don't really believe to like, the high school folks who are trying to find your way around. Apparently, we don't really believe in signs here. Most faculty don't have their names on their door. I don't know if it's some anti-establishment thing or just or, or what. But um, we are very friendly, so and we're used to sort of somewhat lost visitors. So if you don't, if you need to find something, just ask somebody. We're used to giving directions. And like I've given up, like my office is in a really weird place, and there aren't like signs to the building or to my office. And so I just tell people like to go to the building that looks like a castle and ask someone. When I anyway, um, so. Trying to describe where the botany lab is is hopeless. Because people who go to school here still get lost from time. Yeah, exactly. And maybe, you know, like on, on like big college campuses, you have that sense, my God, this is such a huge place and I could get lost here. And you, that really can't happen here. So like we made the insides of the buildings really confusing to sort of compensate for that. Anyway, uh, and I'll be available Friday, um, 3.30 to 4.30. So I think all the help sessions will be in the dining hall, except for Ian's, which will be in the botany lab, which y you'll find um, eventually. Um, let's see. Also, I had said that a great time to catch me is right after class. And that's true in general, but not today. I have to split right after class today to take someone to the airport. So sorry about that. Um, but I'll be around on campus later today. Again, if these times don't work, uh, just drop, drop me a note. Um, one of the interesting things about the web work online system is that I can tell who started the homework. And it's not many of you. Um, but <laughs> that's OK. Those of you who have started it, I'm wondering if there's any, um, like if it's worked OK, if you have any bits of advice for those who have yet to start. No major crises yet? Awesome. OK, that's great. Uh, OK. Let's see. So let's start again with some introductions and names. And so again, I'm wondering if we can go around and um, I won't write them on the board this time. I will write them for myself. Um, names and what do you want to what do you want to know about each other? No, we're not going <laughs> to. We did not do that. We're not going to do the cheese thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how long that joke will live. Yeah. I have to comment about the web work thing. Yep. The only thing I run into is that um, if you have gotten some of them wrong, it just tells you like at least one of these is wrong. It's like to do what you're doing for, but it's like kind of that's just a little bit. Weird. Yeah, that is annoying. <laughs> and I, uh, I don't know that I have control over that. Um, we should then not use the online homework. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I'm totally, I mean, the on, just as a reminder, the online homework is not like you should do the online homework and never interact with humans. So like it's totally fine. To, <laughs> Right, so it's totally fine to ask and, and good to ask questions about the online homework. And one or two, some of them I think are just like kind of match up these graphs. A few of them are a little tricky, I think. And so I'm expecting, totally expecting some people to say like, I don't know, and the, the machine is not giving me helpful information. So um, yeah, and so I, like I did some of the, um, 
uh, you know, they sort of have some sample problems and some demo problems. And I did some of those. And like, there was some that was like, you know, like a nine part multiple choice. And I'm like, all right, I got this. And then it tells me I got one wrong. Yeah, anyway, so it's frustrating. I, I'm, I'm with you there. But anyway, if, if you're not sure what's going on, um, don't, don't spend hours like, just randomly clicking and unclicking things. Just talk to one of us about it. Like I said, definitely a few of the, of the um, online homework problems um, struck me as a little bit tricky. Not in a devious sort of way, but like, oh, we're going to have to think about this. So, Did you have a question also? Or? Okay. Uh, so um, we've decided that we don't want to go around and say our favorite cheese. That's a. <laughs> um, so what do what what do we want to do? Favorite plant. Yeah. All right. All right. That's <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, who 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 wants to lead us off? I'm gonna have to think about this. Okay. <laughs> We won't do Latin names, except for Ian, if he wants. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name's Megan, and my favorite plant is probably an umbrella acacia. <laughs> yeah. My name's Jaina, and my favorite plant is rhubarb. Um, I'm Corey, and I don't know. Maybe like um, like a dandelion or something. Um, I, I don't have a particular flavor. My name's Ian. I love many, many plants, but we're gonna. I'm gonna all stick to horticultural plants. But I really, really like dailies. Huh. Which I think are allergic to uh, or uh, poisonous to cats. I read the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shall we work up? My name is Isaac, and my favorite plants are um, do, do trees count in plants? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. It's, uh, it's COA. We, we don't really have strict boundaries. Yeah, I don't, I, they have, um, they're the ones, they have these small orange leaves, and they don't always fall off in the winter when it's cold. I don't know what they're called, but it's nice that these leaves on trees sometimes just clear snow. <laughs> Oh yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, they are weird. I am Melba, and I don't know a lot of names of plants, so I'm just gonna say I like cacti. I'm a person. I think I like basil. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, would be, it would be immodest. <laughs> uh, I'm Aspen, and another one of my favorite trees is the monkey puzzle. I'm Olivia, and I like aloe. I'm Margarita, and I usually don't think of plants in English, so I go with cacti. <laughs> All right. Good work. <laughs>
Tarzan. I think it's called Sheep Sorrel. <laughs> on botanical matters, I'm going to defer to Ian in this. Um, Is that correct? <laughs> um, I'm Dave. I don't know how to how to choose. Um, maybe uh, I like I really like lavender, um, but Don Redwoods, and uh, I immediately thought of that after I said no Latin because I happen to know the Latin name for those Metasequoia glyptus triboides. It's like the only plant name I know, and I remember. Um, so um, Will Green, who some of you guys may know, and you certainly know his mom, um, his mom and dad taught him to say that like when he was three years old. <laughs> so anyway, I still remember like tiny, tiny little Will saying, that is a quick lip disturbidity. So anyway, that's sort of how I remembered it. Anyway, so, yeah. Uh, the question is going to be, what's your favorite cactus? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, boy. <Sorry>. OK. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, Let's see. So I want to continue on with 12.1, 12.2, and 12.3. And th what we're doing in this chapter is we're getting, or this section, these, this sort of section is we're getting intuition about multivariable functions. So different ways of picturing uh, multivariable functions or services or contour lines, thinking of them in terms of tables of numbers and so on. And I think it just takes, takes some practice sort of seeing, visualizing these things. So I want to do a couple exercises that will continue um, continue doing that. Um, I also have just sort of a few odds and ends about distances and spheres and coordinates. So I'm wondering if you sort of like want to hear me do odds and ends for t 10 or 15 minutes or just jump right into an exercise. Odds and ends? A couple of people are saying that? Okay, so we'll do, we'll do a few odds and ends. All right. So, um, so just a couple of things. Little details. Uh, so the first, when you write a coordinate system in three-dimensional space, you're, there's a there's an x, there's a y, and then there's a z, or sometimes a z. And um, there's a convention. There are different ways of doing it, and the convention is to always have coordinate systems be right-handed. And so, um, which sometimes maybe looks a little bit weird. So if you draw your x and y like this, you have a choice now. Should z go up or down? And the convention is that if you draw them like this, z should go up. And so uh, let's see if I can do this. So if you put your in right hand and in, uh, you put your index finger in the x direction, your other fingers in the y direction, your thumb points in the z direction. And so there are few. Other than general awesomeness, there are few advantages to being left-handed, because like chainsaws and all sorts of everything else is made for right-handed people. But if you're left-handed, you can actually keep doing math and do the right-hand rule at the same time. The rest of you all have to put down your pencil and use this. Um, and another way that, for some reason, um, I find it easier to think about, um, I imagine another way to think about what right-handedness means is if you take the x and turn it into the y, that would be unloosening a lid, and it would go like this. Um, and that would also, um, right, if you have an algae bottle, so there's a good reason to always have these, because it helps you with the right hand rule. Anyway, and it goes up. Right, anyway, um, maybe some of you find that easy to remember. I sort of find it hard. Maybe that's my slight left handed dyslexia. Anyway, um, so the convention is that coordinates are always um, right right-handed. And if you're sort of not paying attention, it can be easy to sort of accidentally do one left-handed. Not the end of the world. OK. So that's odd and end, odds and ends. That's thing number one. Uh, oh, I wanted to say a little bit about distance in three-dimensional space. Um, this, the diagram I'm, I'm about to draw is in your text, so you don't necessarily need to do it um, if you want. If over if you want. So suppose we have a point xy, and we want to know how far is xy from the origin. Well, so in other words, I want to know this length. Okay. So this distance would be x. This distance would be y. Right? And um, this is a right triangle, so Pythagoras tells us that this squared plus this squared is that squared. 
Um, and I'm going to not call this R, even though it looks like it should be R. Uh, maybe I'll call it Q. So x squared plus y squared is Q squared. Now imagine a point not on the plane, but up here that has an x, a y, and a z coordinate. So now if we look at this, that's also a right triangle with a side of q and a side of z. And so this distance, which I am going to call r, so r squared is q squared plus z squared. And well, q squared we just decided is this. So the point of all this is to say that the Pythagorean theorem works in three dimensions just like you think it would. So that's, that should be reassuring. Uh, and if, if I wanted not the distance from the origin, but the distance, say, between x, y, z, and a, b, c, I would do x minus a, y minus b, z minus c. That's sort of, those equations are in the book. I don't think it's worth you watching me write them down. Uh, OK. So that's odds and ends number two. And number three is that sort of an extension of this. Um, so in two dimensions, uh, equation for a circle, we actually encountered that last time, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So this is a set of all points x and y that are a distance r from the origin. And you will not be shocked to see that the equation of a sphere in three dimensions is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. So this is a set of all points x, y, z in space that are a distance r from the origin. Um, if we have a, a sphere that's not centered at the origin, it's floating someplace else, maybe at the point a, b, c in space. It's going to be this. I will write this one down. So I think you'll need that the sort of machinery, this apparatus of distances and spheres for a few of the problems um, for this week's homework. But I think once you sort of realize, you know, once you kind of have this and this at your disposal, you'll be able to puzzle through the couple problems that have this. Not, not anything super deep here. Um, all right, let, let's see. Let me mention one more, th yeah, one more thing. Um, so. It's going to be multiple ways of looking at this mathematical statement. x equals 2. So, uh, okay, so in one dimension, the one dimensional world is a number line. What does x equals 2 look like on a number line? It's a point. It's a point. Yeah, it's a dot. Yep. Yeah. There it is. Um, what about in two dimensions in a on a Cartesian plane? The line have to be a line, yeah. At x equals two. Very nice right-handed coordinate system. 
What about in three dimensions? What does the mathematical statement x equal 2 look like? Plane. It's going to be a plane, right? So I'm going to go It's all the points that have x equal 2. Into, so that's going to be uh, all right, that's a really pretty lame plane. A plane. Okay. Um, so another way to think about this is once you specify x equals two, like there's nothing left. There's just that's just one point. No, no ambiguity. In two D, if you specify x equals two, well y could be anything. Y can so that means you're going to have a line of the any things that y can be. And then in 3D, once you specify x equals 2, you still have two um, things undetermined. That would be y and z. So y means you could go anyway this way. z means you could go anyway that way, as long as your x stays fixed at 2. Um, anyway, so just, again, not tremendously deep, but a useful exercise to sort of, as you're sort of moving from 1D to 3D and back. Just kind of think about the differences between those. All right. So let's um, spend a chunk of time on a few more uh, exercises helping us visualize um, uh, multivariable functions. So what I'd like to do is so let's skip problem one, because that's very similar to something we did in class with a table of numbers. And, and I don't think we need to do that. Problem two is a more graphical and algebraic one. Um, so I think that'll be good to go through. Um, we can take your time with it. So anyway, so work on number two. I'll do some stuff on the board. And we'll see where this leads. So let me just say something real quick here. It, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like everybody's wrestling with this in a good way. Um, right, so a function of two variables, um, we can turn that into a function of one variable by plugging in for one of the variables. So you know, an approach in this, and this I'm sort of thinking this is often the case in math. It's good like to not think for a while and then think. So like, all right, I got to figure out what, what it, what's going on when t is 0. So I'm just going to plug in t equals 0. And of course, you're thinking, but you're like, OK, I will just plug in t equals 0 and see what happens. And you, I will do the math I know how to do. Mm, plugging in algebra cosine of 0, aha, that's 1. So then that whole thing is this. And then you need to think, OK, well, what the heck does that mean? And then the same sort of thing here. OK, I must plug in an eighth. And I'm going to have, now it's just a function of x, right? t is gone. You plugged in for a number. So you plug in for x equals an eighth. Boom, you get this. And then obediently, you summon up uh, pre-calculus knowledge and go, oh, or you don't sum it up. You go to a computer and go, oh, that's right. This is 1 over square root 2, 0.707. That's another way of summoning up knowledge, I guess. Anyway, so you're like, all right, this is 1 over root 2. Fine. So this is this. OK, boom. So then like, that's not, you know, like, then you have to think, OK, well, what does this look like? And then you pl do the same thing for a quarter. OK, I must plug in a quarter. I can do this. I plug in a quarter. Mm -mm. Hey, that happens to be a 0. Cool. It's gone, right? So that happens to be 3. So then, the then we just have like some one-dimensional graphs to do, and then um, interpret. And then you're going to do a similar thing here. Now you're going to plug in for 2. And now you've just got t left. So again, like just the algebra, you know, like algebra you know, just obediently, all right, I must plug in t equals 2, or sorry, x equals 2. And you do that, and then you get this, and you're like, OK, now what does that mean? So um, take another moment or two to um, sort of chug through this, and then we'll look at some pictures, hand-drawn and otherwise, of this. Okay. All right, so let's, um, let's talk about this, and then also look at um, some pretty pictures. So um, here I've plotted h of x0, x8, x and a quarter. And so again, sort of the first couple steps is like, I'm not even going to worry about two, three dimensions. I'm just going to do like one plot at a time. Boom, boom, boom. And so if you plug in t equals 0, cosine 0 is 1. This is just 3 plus 3 sine blah. This is a sine wave with a period of 20. Um, x has to be 20 for this to get to 2 pi, which is a full cycle. Um, you can also just plot this on a computer or calculator if you're not sure what this 1D function looks like. But then you see, right, so the picture here is it's a jump rope from 0 to 10. You're like, oh, that sort of makes sense. 
This is shifted up three. The amplitude is three. So the peak here is going to be six. And then, so as we vary t, this, this part of the function stays the same. This cosine piece is just like different constants. And so that's just going to affect the overall amplitude. And so for the orange graph, that's this. Cosine 2 pi over 8 is 1 over root 2.707. So I just approximated that's 3. You know, it's a little bit less than 3. So it's a little bit smaller. Um, but the, the x dependence is, is the same. It's just the amplitude of the sine wave is, has changed. Um, and then by the time we get to time of a quarter, this is cosine of 90 degrees. That's 0. And so that means that this whole piece here is 0. So we just have 3. So z of x is 3. So it's just a line. So the picture is, right? you've got this jump rope, and it's, it's like half of a cosine wave that starts up, and then it go, it's going to go down. So it's going to kind of right, do this. My arm's not, but you kind of get the idea. Is this sort of making sense? Good. OK. So now, um, in words, what, is, what, what does this mean? Anybody say? What is that representing? How the height of the rope changes over time at a specific loci. Yeah, so yeah exactly right. So if you're at T, yep. So if, if, you're, if you're standing here, sorry, if you're at 2, excuse me, you're watching the rope go up and down. And it never gets all the way down to the bottom. Um, it, the max is going to be, well, 4.76. The min is going to be uh, 3 minus 1.76, whatever that is, subtraction. Um, and so you'll just sort of, you know, sort of see this wiggling like that. Um, so one of the things from yesterday's class that uh, mentioning here is you've got a function of two variables. If you fix one variable, you have a function of one variable. And that's sort of a key to understanding these things. Like, OK, x and t are changing at the same time. There's a pattern through space. There's a pattern through time. Let's just hold one constant and see what we get. So that's often a key to like, having these things make sense, be understandable. And they're also going to be a key to figuring out um, derivatives as well. You can, again, you can see, you can all smell that coming down the road. Yeah? Correct. Yep. Oh, I drew that wrong. Sorry. Let's let me let's let me let's let me let me let me try this again. Yeah. All right. Four point seven six. Right. So this should be exactly. Yeah. So the it's going 1.76 above 3 and 1.76 below 3. Yep, and it's a cosine wave. Yep, sorry. Thank you for catching that. Uh, OK. Uh, let's talk a little bit about these, and then we'll play with pictures for a moment. Um, let me just, I just don't want this to turn off, because it, it's hard to turn back on. All right. Um, all right, so in words, what's going on here? Right, yeah, there's nothing to solve. It's just like, what does this mean? If somebody, uh, I mean, I guess you could solve it, but the question is just asking, what, what, what would this tell you? Two seconds, how the height changes as you move from zero to five. Yeah. Um, feet. Yes, yes. Is it feet? Yeah. Right, yeah. Yep, so time is, time is constant. And then this would be the height at x equals 0. This would be the height at x equals 5. So it tells you how much taller uh, or higher the rope is at x equals 5 than x equals 0 at the particular time t equals 2. Um, and here, we're now the thing that's constant is 5. So that's our x. It means we're, we're fixed here, right in the middle, and we want to know from time 
t to time, uh, from time 2 to time 0, how much does it change? So this is a change in time, and this would be a change in position. Uh, questions on those? All right, so let's play with some technology. Uh, so Wolfram Alpha, I'm guessing you're all acquainted with Wolfram Alpha. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, Wolfram Alpha can do everything your calculators can do and uh, enormous amounts more. Uh, and so it can make decent plots in, of uh, two-dimensional functions. Um, so before we plot this thing, which I think is going to be a little hard to look at, let's do what we did last time. Um, is this sufficient? Should we darken the room further? That would be cool. OK. Uh, there's a, the switch in the back. That would that will probably do the trick. This, the up and down switch should do it. Ooh, how's that? OK. Um, is the font sufficient size? Yeah. OK, great. All right, so this was the example we did last time in class. Um, and so most of the time for Wolfram, you, you just ask it to do something as if you would ask a person. Um, but you don't even need to say please. Just say plot blah, and it'll just do it. Um, and it's nice also because, just a reminder, Wolfram tells you what you think, what it thinks you asked it. So it engages in active listening. What I'm hearing you ask is <laughs> plot x squared plus y squared. And it's actually important to look at that because sometimes you might misplace a parenthesis or something, and it interprets your answer, your input differently. So it's a good idea to kind of get in the habit of, of checking this. All right, so it says, I think you wanted me to plot this. What do you think of this? So um, I sometimes, the, the default for this, I sometimes find a little disorienting. Because x, this is 0, 1 half, 1. x plus x goes this way. And then y, positive y, is back. So it's worth looking at the labels, too. I find it, if you, if you need to. Here it's symmetric. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and we saw last time that this was a, um, like a bowl sort of thing. I kind of acted it out. Here's the um, wire mesh drawing of that. And if you fix hold constant, say, uh, here's a good example, like x equals 1, then this becomes 1 plus y squared. That's just a parabola shifted up 1. There is that parabola shifted up one. And so the, all of these like, lines are just one-dimensional curves for fixed values of x or y. And that's what we were drawing over here for a more complicated thing. Um, Wolfram will also make a contour plot. The convention seems to be that redder is lower. Which is a little bit troubling to me if you like to think about heat, where hot things are often red and temperature and would have higher temperature. But anyway, uh, I guess that's why it's Wolfram Alpha, not Feldman Alpha. I mean, there are probably lots of reasons. But anyway, so this is, uh, right, we decided the contour line is a circle. That's the set of um, uh, xy values that have an altitude of 1. And then I don't know exactly what the values are, but the contour lines, it's a little hard to see here, are getting closer together indicating that it's getting steeper as you go up. And you can change the limits of this. Uh, I think. Mm. Let's see. Not what I wanted you to do. There we go. Oh, it didn't do me. It didn't give me contour lines. That's annoying. Oh, there we go. I was just thinking. That makes it a little clearer that the um, the lines are getting closer together, indicating it's getting more steep. Another thing you can do, which sometimes is helpful is you can ask it to plot the contour lines on the mesh or on the surface. Yep. 
so Wolfram Alpha is a really useful tool. It's, it's, I mean, it's a website. You just go to it, you, you plug in things. And it um, can be really helpful for, for visualizing surfaces, because it's hard, at least for me in my head, to picture these things. And it's really hard, even when I can picture it, which I kind of can for this, to draw it. So let's now plug in this thing and see what happens. So we want x to go from 0 to 10. And maybe we'll do y to go from 0 to, uh, let's do 0 to, let's do 4 pi. So that'll be two cycles of the cosine. Oh no, we just need to go to 2, sorry. And all right, let's see here. This is what, 3 plus 3. Uh, I meant to say 2 because there's a 2 pi in the t. So I think, that, I think that'll do what I want it to do. So this is pi over 10. Let's do this. Oh, uh, yeah. OK. I wonder if it's going to like x pi. I bet it's not. It's taking too long. I don't have a good feeling. Mm. Wow. All right, well, good work. So active listening, it did. it's telling me what to do. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's try this. Good. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Sorry, stop it. Stop. Uh, OK. All right, that looks promising. Yay. OK. So, um, uh, so this is T. 0 to 2. So here's t equals 0. We have just like the first half of a cosine starting at 3. I guess that goes up to 6, a little bit above 5. And then it's harder. To, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can, you can, right, you can, do I even need to say anything? Do you see what's going on here? <laughs> so, right, so the, the jump rope, the jump rope is going down. There it is, just barely touching the ground. Then it goes up, and then it goes down. And if you were standing at any particular point in space, that's this sort of thing, you'll also see a sine wave or a cosine wave going this way, but it would only have full amplitude if you were there in the middle. Um, so I said last time that calculus 3 is, I think, like algebraically, it's no more complicated than calc 1 and 2, I think. But the interpretations are much more interesting and fun. So like, there's more interesting things to talk about, but the algebra is just this, you know, algebra is just algebra. So hopefully that's a, a, a nice illustration of this. Um, are there questions on this example? All right. Um, so let's do um, another, pro another uh, exercise. Again, we can kind of take our time with. It will also, it's also number two from this sheet. And this one, um, they're going to start Start you with a contour diagram and then uh, puzzle through some stuff. So, all right. So, um, so let's talk through this and then look at some pictures. Um, I, I think this. I, I like this problem. I don't. I certainly don't think it's easy. It's one of these sort of deceptively, s sort of simple ones. I don't know. When I was doing this to prepare, I was like, oh, this is. E Wait a minute. Anyway. So I had to have some conversations with myself for this, and let, let's see. So, um, all right. So here's the picture that's on your on your handout, and the first our first task is uh, once after we're done admiring the waves is to label these contour lines. So it's like you're given a map of Cadillac or something, but you don't have the altitude levels. We need to figure it out, and so there are lots of ways to do this. One way to say is, okay, well, what's the value of z at zero zero? Oh, the function tells me that. That's the whole point of the function. You plug in a value, it tells you z. So let's do that. All right, uh, 0 minus 0 is 0. OK. And so since the function, the altitude that's not drawn directly on here, is 0 
here, it has to be 0 all the way along this curve, because that's what a contour line is. It's a line of constant altitude. I should mention, I just wrote this here because I keep forgetting to say this. Um, a contour line is also known as a level set. It's a set of xy values that is level, i.e. not going up or down. Um, so our book, it's a totally standard term. Our book uses the two interchangeably. Level set's a little bit more general, because if you're talking about three or four dimensional functions, contour lines aren't lines, they're surfaces, so you, you call them sets. Anyway. Um, so then I might ask, OK, well, what, what's going on over here? Well, what's the value of the function at uh, x equals 0, y equals 1? Well, the function tells me that. That's the whole point of a function. You tell me x and y, it tells me z. So let's see. OK, plug in. All right, I get 1. So this is 1. I, should, I guess I should label these. All right, so we decide this is 0, this is 1. And if you keep playing this game, you will get that. All right, so then, great. Now what does this mean? So if you, if you started, I don't know, let's say here, and started walking up on, the, on this page in the y direction, are you going up or down? Up. And if you started over here, if you start in the y direction, are you going up or down? Up or down, up, right. So, so this is just no matter what happens, wherever you are in terms of x, if you increase y, you're going up. So that's what you can see on this graph. And that's what this algebra is trying to tell you. If you just fix this at a constant, if you increase y, you increase z. Um, OK, so now let's think in the other direction. So if you. If you keep y constant, 1 or 2 or 3 or, any, or anything, and you start walking in the x direction, what is your life? What is your, what's, what's going on? Sinusoidal. Sinusoidal, yeah. You're going up and down. Um, different y values mean you'll start at a different place, but you're all just, you know, so the picture here is, all right, to let this be y and this be x. So if no matter which way I turn in this direction, I'm just looking up a straight line. <coughs> But if I go in this direction, I would be experiencing a sign. Right? So this way, I'm sort of doing a sign. But then at any point, if I look up, it just looks like a straight line. I might go down here. I might be a little bit lower, but then it still looks straight up. Okay. Um, so then here, this is the scenario um, here. So the picture is if, I'm, if I start at y equals 0, and I just want to know what's going on in the x direction, it's a sign like this. Yeah? Could that be a negative sign? 0 minus sine of x? Oh, yes. OK. So mm, there's no way to fix it without raising. Thanks. All right. All right. That's, that's right. Um, a long time ago, I had a, um, a professor who, in um, some classes in particular, this was in a statistical mechanics class, actually I took before grad school, he would say, like, I know I'm going to lose a lot of minus signs, so I'm going to like put some extra ones here so that if I need them, I can gather them later. Anyway, so that can be sort of a good thing. I, in this place, I, I think, hopefully I'm done losing minus signs. But there are some days when you just know, depending on what you're doing, Minus signs are going to be flying. Um, so let me draw that just a little more clearly. OK, so minus sign, an upside down sign thing. So this means if you start, right, so this is 2 pi, that's pi, here's pi over 2. So this tells me that pi over 2, you're going to be in a valley, and 3 pi over 2, you're going to be on a ridge. So if I'm starting here at 0, I start by, I go down, pi over 2, I'm in a ridge. At any point, I look up, and I see just a, it looks like a, you know, just be a straight walk up or a straight walk down. I come here at 3 pi over 2. Now I'm on, on, the, on the top. And again, it would be a straight line like this. OK, so now having uh, done a sort of interpretive dance for that, let's, let's, um, let's plot this and see. All right, so what do we want? This is what y minus sine x. Uh, I didn't. All right, let's see. For x equals. 
0 to 2 pi y equals uh, minus 3 to 3. How about that? Uh, yes, these aren't these pink-ish things. Yep. So the function value is the value of z, and then yeah, so that's a z value. Yep. Uh, let's see. Should we darken things further? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So it says I. I think you want me to plot sine of y minus x from x equals 0 to 2 pi and y equals minus 3 to 3. I was like, yes, thank you very much. That's what, just what I was hoping for. All right, so let's see if we can see this. And this is what I was trying to do all this stuff about, right? So uh, x is this way. And so moving in x, we're just seeing signs. But in terms of y, it's just a, a, a uh, straight shot. So this sort of looks maybe like, um, I don't know, like a piece of corrugated, almost like, like corrugated roofing or, or corrugated paper or something that's ripply in one direction, but is straight in the other. Uh, OK, so now, so this is an example, by the way, where I think, like if I were trying to understand the surface, this picture is a lot more helpful to me than that one. And sometimes it's sort of the other way around. Sometimes contour maps are more useful. Let's see, there is that contour map. Um, lower values here, higher values uh, there for larger values of y. Uh, all right. Not sure if this will look interesting, but let's try it because we can do it. Uh, sure. <laughs> so, I mean, this is right. A, a, yeah. I mean, what what I'd sort of like to do is actually. Well, would I? I don't know. Put this on its side because I want. Anyway, that's fine. Uh, questions on this example? So, so again, what 12, 1, 12, 2, and 12, 3 are about is thinking about functions of two variables. Um, often the way to think about them is hold one of the variables fixed and then see what you get. So you can kind of like slice through the surface. Let me go back to this plot. That's what sort of gives you these meshes, right? I'm saying, oh, well, if you go in the y direction, it's just a line of slope 1. And if you go in the x direction, it's just a sign. So you can hold, you know, sort of think one variable at a time. Um, and then you can also picture contour lines, which is picturing level sets, fixed values of z. And um, we'll, we'll get more and more practice kind of going back and forth between these different graphical views, how to um, start with an equation and get these sorts of things, um, and then also how to interpret these types of things. So I think at this point, we've covered everything for the homework for this week. Um, I don't think, I think this problem is probably as hard as any that are on the homework set. At least that was my design. This, this again, I don't, this was not, I think, an easy problem, but hopefully a kind of fun one to think through. Um, as you work through the homework, if you have any troubles with web work, please don't beat your head against the wall. Let me know. Um, and if you have questions, um, you know, things you're stuck on, I don't expect all the problems to be super easy. Be sure to let one of us know. So I can stick around for a minute or two as I pack up, but then I need to um, run off to the airport, but I'll be around later today. <laughs>